Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilson, and I am the Aniyanwiyahi Community Program Coordinator at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. I'm here with Fawn Douglas, and she is our first presenter in the Winter Lecture Series, Our Voices Amplified, which chooses to focus on art as an extension of voice. Um, she has an amazing presentation for us today, and I am going to leave it to her now. Jen, thank you so much. And I want to send a big thank you to the Cherokee Nation and the Cherokee Museum for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with our relatives over on the east side. I'm, I'm coming in from the west. And yeah, I've been excited about this last year since we first started talking about it. And so just, uh, yeah, very, very thankful and very humbled to be here with your community. Uh, so a little bit about my community. Um, I'm coming from Las Vegas, Nevada, and here in my space, well, we're on Nuwuvi land or Nuwu land. Uh, Nuwu means the people in our language, um, a member of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe, and I identify as a Southern Paiute woman, even though I do have a beautiful mixed heritage of Pawnee, Muscogee, Southern Cheyenne, and Scottish roots. Um, yeah, so I actually have a, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> so I'm an artist that walks through multiple dimensions. Uh, like I said, I'm a member of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. I earned my master of fine arts from UNLV. I'm a, an arts commissioner for the city of Las Vegas. I represent Ward 3. I am also on the board of directors for our nonprofit organization, Indigenous AF. I'm the co-owner of New Wu Art and Activism Studios. And I'm the cultural engagement specialist from Yow Wolf. I'm also the co-founder of Weaving Our Cultures Arts Festival, which is formerly the Women of Color Arts Fest here in Las Vegas. I'm also a curator of community. I continue my art practice, even when I'm not physically making an object or making a painting, I am still curating community and it is very much steeped in my art practice. And I'm gonna be talking about all of these different roles and different hats I wear throughout the presentation. So first off, just talking about myself and where I come from. I'm a member of the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. And here's a very awkward picture of me as Little Miss Paiute, 1990. Uh, I was about 10 here. <laughs> and, and it was a lot of fun. I like to, you know, kind of pull, you know, pull things back to, to humor, you know, when I'm presenting, you know, because I haven't always been, you know, this confident person. I mean, okay, I'm not always confident either. I have my moments, but, uh, you know, started out very awkward and just kind of pushed out into the powwow circle or pushed out into, you know, the culture that, that I'm in and just expected to just go with it. So this is me <laughs> very awkward at a parade, um, sitting on top of a car, just very scared. <laughs> but I like to kind of just pull that in because, you know, we, we all start somewhere. We all start somewhere in our journey and it's really interesting what you know really lands on us and really moves us into the person that we become uh, so like i said i'm from las vegas nevada southern paiute uh, nuwu and um, our paiute people are actually not just from like the las vegas area yes we're the indigenous people uh, for las vegas nevada but we're also a part of this big network you know this network called the salt song trail um, and that goes through Southern Nevada, Southern California, Arizona, through Utah. And the salt songs are what, uh, what bridge our communities. Uh, we have our, our salt songs involved in our ceremonies. These are the songs that describe, you know, the paths, like the ways and our, well, our cultural environment. And then within this environment, you know, we have a very uh, long story of <laughs> story of colonization as every, you know, tribe or every, any person from the culture does have. But our story really starts, you know, well, it didn't start with Las Vegas, but the Las Vegas story started with us uh, in the early, uh, well, in the 1800s, there was colonization. But in the early 1900s, the city of Las Vegas was established. And so this pushed a lot of our people out, but a small group of people remained, you know, a band of us, about 50 members. In fact, we are 50 tribal members currently today over the age of 21. And so um, in the early 1900s, we still had our, you know, small area. And, you know, we, we built commerce on this small area. This area is like located not even about a block uh, north of Fremont Street, which is like one of the main casino areas. And so in the 1970s, we started a smoke shop. 
and it grew and thrived into our cigarette business. And, you know, we built a cigar room. And, and with that, you know, we we're able to tell our stories. I grew up there, like right behind this building, this structure is our Paiute uh, colony. And there's about like 24 trailers there. And just growing up there, it was really harsh, you know, because everything about the city of Las Vegas, everything that was ill about the city was placed all around us. There's a crematorium across the street, the railroad track right behind us, homeless shelters uh, to the north of us. And it's just, just like, a, well, somebody actually described it to me as Skid Row. Uh, but this is a, a community. This is a thriving community that we have. And I was really proud to grow up there. I feel like I learned a lot about um, just life in general, you know, growing up there and also being able to, you know, contribute back to the tribe, you know, being a tribal council member about 20 years ago. And, and that was a lot of fun. Learned a lot about, you know, our family business and our roots and just why we drive and move forward. Even moving forward to sharing our story, our story of colonization and all the ills that were around us through an act of Congress in the 1980s, we're able to, uh, you know, get land back, land back to the tribes. So we had 4,000 acres that is slightly outside of the city of Las Vegas. And with that uh, acreage, um, our people found that, you know, because it's beautiful, we wanted like a nice, clean air place to live. But we also discovered that there was an aquifer right underneath us. And so, you know, we had this use it or lose it clause. So how are, you know, a handful of Paiute people going to use, you know, thousands of acre feet of water? Uh, well, what, you know, uses up more water in the desert than a golf course? So we built the first golf course, Snow Mountain. Then we built uh, Sun Mountain. And then the third course, the Championship Wolf Course. You know, very proud of these moves. And these moves weren't because we wanted to be good golfers. But these moves were made because we had to retain our water rights. This is an act of sovereignty. And uh, opening the New Wu Cannabis Marketplace, the biggest dispensary in, in the world, was also an act of sovereignty and also a natural progression. We started out with cigarette sales, then moved into the being in the largest walk-in humidor you know, for cigar products. So smokes was another natural step for us. Our tribal council made many steps and many moves to get this going. In fact, we're in, under construction for our two-story drive-through, you know, larger facility currently, which is going to be opening next month. So that was just a little bit about my tribe, a little bit about, um, you know, our, our journey through sovereignty. And I, I pull these, you know, themes into my arts as well. So when I think about art as activism and art as storytelling, I think about the, the areas that are around us. So around us in, in the city of Las Vegas are all these gorgeous, you know, mountainsides. We have the Red Rock Canyon, we have Gold Butte National Monument, Sloan Canyon, and we have all these messages from our ancestors, the petroglyphs, the, pe uh, the pictographs. And years ago, I was finding, uh, it was back, back in 2015, that people were using our petroglyphs as target practice. And as any indigenous person who's trying to protect their lands knows, like this is absolutely infuriating. And even in the Red Rock Canyon, people were tagging up and graffitiing, you know, our pictographs. And these are like hundreds to thousands of years old, all these messages. And so I, I use that to, you know, really drive home a message. It's like, well, what do I want to tell the people about this area? Because art is that bridge. Art is that storytelling uh, projection, a way for other people to understand where we're coming from and why the place is so special. Even with this, uh, this watercolor you know, work that I made, it's called Where the Creator Goes to Dream. This is in uh, regards to the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. The Air Force wanted to take this uh, preserved <laughs> land and use it for red flag exercises, which is basically bombing the, the, you know, this area where there's a large population of our bighorn sheep. And so I did arts, you know, to really, you know, convey that story of why this area is important, why it is very special to our Southern Paiute people and why it should be special for all. But my art don't, not only tells a story about our lands and our culture and our, our ways of preservation, uh, but also I like to add, you know, just a little kitsch, <laughs> especially when it comes to powwow dance. So I've been a dancer in the powwow circle since I was a kid. I'm on a little break right now, uh, but I'm definitely wanting to get back to it this summer. Uh, but I started, you know, as a traditional dancer, Southern traditional, then moved into uh, fancy shawl and uh, jingle and jingle dance. 
And I pulled all these different elements and some old powwow numbers from competing and some numbers from my daughter as well, because she's a dancer. And I made this, you know, just as a nod to talking about, you know, uh, more, more like a pun. Uh, this artwork is called We Don't Dance for Money. Uh, but it also shows that I have danced for money because when you're competing in the powwow circle, there's a purse or there's a, a prize for it. Uh, but me and my daughter, you know, we like to go into powwows, you know, not just not for that. We like to go in a spiritual way. And sometimes we won't go for a competition. We'll miss a day and we'll just go there because we, you know, we feel it. We want to feel that circle. We want to feel that presence. Uh, but but yeah, so I have different nods of lane stitch and different um art ways of all of my different tribes, because of course I mentioned I come from a mixed heritage um, into this work of art that has been acquired by the Nevada Museum of Art. And I, and I continue to pull this, you know, pull regalia into my work. Um, this, is, this piece is entitled Joy, and it was, you know, an exhibition piece that I had on the wall, but I also took it off the wall to wear it as a, as a shirt. Um, I love all the different colors. I love all the different representations. Uh, you know, different colors represent different things like land, water, and, and for me, happiness. I also do these very large uh, mural pieces or tapestry pieces. This one was in regards to the, the destruction of the Segoro cacti at the border wall. I mean, these cacti were being knocked over and these cacti are very special to the Tohonohodom people. And so I wanted to, you know, really talk about this and using my art to talk about it. You know, it looks like it's a post-apocalyptic uh, kind of look. Is it fire or is it sunrise? Um, are we being, is there a rebirth? Is there a reemergence? Is there a reenactment of, of different ways, you know, at, when we look at this work of art? And also being playful, you know, using my activism to center my joy. And to be honest, it's taken me uh, many years to think about joy in my art practice. And joy and materiality, um, you know, just finding different ways because our people are known for our weaving, um, like weaving baskets, those kind of styles. And so I was looking at, you know, basically the, the trash around me and how can I repurpose these things and make them into something beautiful. This is uh, from my collection of Nuwubi baskets. This one's entitled Power, and it is just uh, conduit wires that were found on my properties and all put together into this one piece. And this is a piece that actually fits in my hands. But I continue this basket weaving practice and I continue this, you know, mixed with, uh, you know, some of our willow, our local willow, but the conduit wires and also thinking about materials and thinking about, you know, what it means to be traditional. And is this not traditional? Um, I have an artist I look for, I look up to Gerald Clark, and he does these large basket, you know, works, you know, from smashed beer cans or Pepsi cans or whatever he finds, you know, on his reservation. I mean, he has harvested and forged these items off of his traditional homelands, as I have with these pieces. Is that not traditional? Is that not traditional to take that what is in our environment and repurpose it? And you and that, yeah, it centers my joy. It makes me really happy to use these items and to use little nods, you know, to our to my culture, my people. Uh, this uh, basket piece is a, has an onyx uh, mirror that's in the center of it. And it has the desert tortoise, a symbol of my tribe. So materiality, you know, thinking about how I use, uh, you know, ribbons or sinew or all these different materials for my art pieces, but not actually making regalia. I mean, I have relatives that do that. Um, but for, for my practice, like, you know, let me actually make something, something that's tangible, something that means something. And so I had these three girls. Uh, this is uh, Ben Alex Dupree's daughters. And they're amazing <laughs> and incredible. And I was very much inspired by these young women, you know, coming into, you know, the circle and they all had their different style. Each of them was, you know, doing something different. And so I wanted to make some dresses for them, but also lean that into, you know, my show. I had this as a part of my thesis show at, U well, for UNLV. And I'll talk about, you know, the space a little bit later. Uh, but being able to, you know, pull my culture and my ways into my art practice and really just showing its relevancy in uh, contemporary art. 
So when we think about art, art and activism, I'm talking about storytelling. I also use my storytelling through performance. And, and just a trigger warning for those that are viewing, I'm going to be touching on a few topics, you know, about MMIW and, and other things. Uh, but this piece that I did, this is a, you know, a couple of pictures from, <clears throat> from one of my friends. And I did this performance piece and it was at our, our Snow Mountain Power Grounds. It was during the time of COVID actually. So like nobody had danced on the powwow grounds, um, and you could see animal tracks throughout. It was really, really quite beautiful. And we shot this at sunrise. Um, and this is from photographer, videographer, Crystal Ramirez. It was just her, myself, and my daughter. My daughter was actually carrying the beat. She had a hand drum. And I was dancing. This is the dance called Dear Woman Rising. And so I did this performance piece and created this, uh, this dress um, in response to my journey, you know, going through sexual abuse, sexual assault and emerging, you know, from that and, you know, not being a victim, but being a survivor and being able to tell my story and tell, you know, what had happened to me. And through performance art, I was able to pull those things out of me and unleash that. And I think that's really uh, a gift, a gift from the creator to any artist is to be able to, you know, remove it. I mean, once you feel some kind of negative or, you know, uh, sorrow or whatever that feeling is, pull it out of you, put it on paper, put it in performance, put it in, you know, whatever medium you're working in. And so with Dear Woman Rising, with this performance, I was coming out of a, a state of, well, you know, being deceased and emerging with the sunrise and going through the motions of being hurt, being assaulted and picking myself up, picking myself up off of the ground and, you know, starting to dance again, starting to move slowly, but then starting to dance and feel myself and feel my power. Um, so this is really, uh, it didn't just feel like performance. It felt like ceremony. And even when I reflect on it back, it, it actually was, and so I, I use, you know, a political, you know, uh, the political climate around me, you know, for performance, for my art, for all the different things. And even in the beginning of performance, like addressing, like, you know, with uh, my own story and MMIW, uh, but also what was happening in the country, like, you know, a couple of years ago, what was happening at the border, you know, these women of color, uh, there was out really awful things uh, happening to the women that were being held. In fact, there was a Cameroon woman who shared her story about having her uh, her female parts removed. Uh, she had a hysterectomy and it was really awful. And so I was watching this on the news and I was just in disgust about history repeating itself. And so I reached out to some friends and, you know, asked them if they wanted to do this performance piece in front of the ICE building on Las Vegas Boulevard. And I entitled it as Genocide. Uh, and then just talking about how these genocidal practices were were happening all over again. My mother would talk about these stories of, you know, in the 70s, living in Oklahoma, well, where I was born, um, in Claremore, and women being, um, you know, going in for, well, well checks, but they were coming out uh, sterilized, some without their knowledge. Uh, and so I would, when I was seeing this uh, repeat of history, I had to do this performance and I did this performance with my friends and just community members and created this work of art, uh, you know, talking about, well, it says, you know, African, Latinx, indigenous women sterilized without consent. This is genocide. We say no to ICE. And so I use my body. I use the, this political vessel, you know, to convey that message. And I had these uh, hospital gowns that were donated with this gesture of, uh, you know, well, red paint to represent the blood. But when I think about performance, you know, things things have changed. I mean, I, like I said, my art practice has, you know, it's gone through ebbs and flows of just how I'm, uh, what I respond to, but also positioning joy. Like joy is activism. To be able to breathe is activism. To be able to, to get up, you know, with all the things that the life has thrown at us and to be able to smile and enjoy another day. Like how is that not, you know, activism, revolutionary? because everything about this country was meant to stomp us out, to remove us. There's so many different policies of removal, but here we are, we're still here today. We still have our ways and we're still able to practice these things. 
uh, one of the game changers for me was uh, interacting and being introduced to and getting to know the artist Rose Simpson. Uh, she came and we were doing this, uh, this piece where it was called a transformance, but it pulled together our community, the women in our community. In fact, this is a picture of my cousin Katie, Gina, my daughter, Soul, and we are creating these works, these pieces, uh, you know, necklaces of adornment, um, the dresses, uh, the, the belts, all the thing to, to really um, bring up the transformance. So here's Rose in us. And, you know, every part of this was something that meant something. And besides ourselves being this vessel, we we're thinking about how we adorn ourselves and how we walk as indigenous women. How do we walk, you know, on this ground, knowing that these are our lands? You know, how do we really state that purpose and reclaim? And so we did this transformance at my, at my space, the Niwu Art Gallery and Community Center, our studios. And uh, originally, we're going to use her her car as this vessel, but we uh, we determined ourselves. We are this vessel. We are this machine that moves forward, that drives forward. And so we did this. We walked together. We walked together, you know, down the street, disrupting space, but breathing slowly, making time stand still, and being in unison to walk together side by side. What, what is it when we walk together and support each other as indigenous women, indigenous people, and who are we leading? Who is following behind us? Who do we carry and we lift up with us? And after that moment, it, it, like I said, I mean, it was a transformance. That was the, the title of Rose's performance, but it was also very transforming to me. I felt this, like, this uplifting of my entire spirit. Uh, it was very... Um, very moving and again like ceremony so besides my art practice uh, like i mentioned earlier you know i do wear a lot of hats and one of those hats is working for meow wolf so i am a cultural engagement specialist for meow wolf and working for meow wolf is not like walking in two worlds it's like walking and flying and moving through multiple dimensions <laughs> and it is absolutely amazing uh, I've been with Meow Wolf for over three plus years, and in my role, um, I get to do amazing things like land acknowledgments, uh, working on the land acknowledgments, not only for, you know, Santa Fe, uh, Meow Wolf, but the Omega Mart that opened here in Las Vegas, Convergence Station in Denver, and currently working with uh, Texas locations and beyond, because no matter where we are, we are on indigenous land. And besides, you know, working on the land acknowledgements, it's also about what is the what is the community, the how do we connect with them? What is the relationship? Because we all know, we all know, you know, land acknowledgements are the bare minimum. So what are we doing to bridge communities and have a relationship with the communities wherever we may be? Uh, oh, and this is a picture of my daughter in the jingle dress and Gina. They're both from our Las Vegas Paiute community. They were a part of the opening ceremony. So another thing that I do is I help co-produce these ceremonies. So when we have an opening, uh, we have this engagement with the community people. And besides, you know, land acknowledgments into action, I worked on uh, uh, getting together with uh, some of the youth, well, not the youth, all ages, <laughs> with the Institute of American Indian Arts, because our first Meow Wolf is based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So again, how do we create this relationship with the communities we're in? The Institute of American Indian Arts has been in partnership with us to uh, uh, do our internship program. In fact, the first one was there, and we continue to do this. And it's not only with IAIA, but also with you know Denver Universities, uh, Las Vegas Universities, and we're already starting to engage with our internship programs in Texas. And here's a picture of well, some of our interns from IAIA and uh, oh, New Mexico University. But also that uh, community engagement with some of our elders. Here's a picture of uh, some of our Southern Paiute language and cultural group, uh, but also touching base with the local artist, Luis Varela Rico. He did this amazing um, desert tortoise, Pekai, in the Paiute language, that means turtle. <laughs> and we're able to have this, and it was over, you know, in front of our uh, uh, Omega Mart, which is located in Area 15. And we're able to have these moments where we're really bridging art, uh, repurposing, connections, 
and local artists and our local tribal people. And, and like I said, you know, my, my job isn't just, you know, here in Las Vegas and beyond, but, you know, working with the Convergence Station to help engage with that community. Um, here's a picture of me speaking at the opening, the opening ceremony and being able to cut the ribbon with the founders. This is such a proud moment and such like this, ah, <laughs> like moments because with Convergence Station, well, with each Meow Wolf, there's always these lessons learned. How can we do it better? How can we do it? you know, more community and at the convergence station, like even when you go in, I mean, for the, the simple thing of going to the restroom, you see the sign that says restroom and baño, like, you know, in Spanish, but you also have the Arapaho word for bathroom. Uh, we've also engaged with different indigenous artists to be in inside exhibition and also telling the story of the Sand Creek massacre within one of the exhibition space, spaces within the Convergence Station. So still tapping into these communities, tapping into history, but also tapping into now. And we still engage with these communities. Here's a dancer from the opening ceremony and some of us in the front. What a fun time. <laughs> but also keeping that uh, relationship with the Denver Indian Center there. Uh, that's Joanna, one of our community engagement um, managers, you know, with some of the people from the Denver Indian Center. That's doing a lot of cool things, by the way. If y'all haven't heard of them, check out what they're doing for their community because it is absolutely stellar. So artist activism, storytelling through land back. So we did a thing <laughs> while I was working on my Master of Fine Arts from UNLV. Um, well, my partner, this is my partner, Dr. A.B. Wilkinson and myself. Um, so he knew my dreams. He knew and supported, you know, my vision for wanting my own art studio, wanting my own, you know, spaces, wanting a community center, wanting to do all these different things. And this is uh, part of my five year, 10 year plan. Um, but yeah, 2020, he saw that the synagogue was for sale. Um, he's like, we should look at that. And I was like, do not mess with me. I'm working on my masters. I have enough stress. Uh, but you know, what's it hurt to go check it out? So we went to go look at this space and, you know, we went inside, you know, with the realtors and there was a big hole in the ceiling. You could basically see the sky, uh, you know, some of the windows broken. It was just an absolute uh, mess. Um, yeah. And so we went to, you know, tour it and we're looking and um, like, all right, you know, what can we do with this space? Like, let's really, you know, think about this. If this could be something, you know, that could be our, our future. And here's a picture of the outside of it. Uh, but yeah, so this used to be the Sharia Tefila Synagogue. Um, it was a temple, you know, for our local Jewish community. And so this was a temple and it has the adjoining buildings. Um, you know, here's a picture of it from the street side. Oops. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the buildings are pretty, you know, pretty shot, pretty worn. Um, the rabbi lived in the house to the right and there was a mikvah, you know, a cleansing ceremony, like in the casita space in the back. And so we were looking into our savings, like, what can we do? You know, we couldn't really afford what they were asking, like, absolutely not. But we made an offer, you know, it was just like, Hey, this is what we got. This is our story. This is what we want to do. And, um, you know, I'll come back to that actually. Um, and so we were talking with them and this is the place where the mikvah was and what was happening in 2020, well, COVID was hitting and stocks were plummeting. And then all of a sudden, you know, as COVID was hitting Las Vegas, uh, almost at the same moment, you know, we get this call from the, from the Jewish congregation. They're like, we'll take your offer. And so my partner and myself were absolutely shocked, but like, all right, then, well, I guess we own these buildings. <laughs> and so we started to, um, you know, because this area, Las Vegas, like I said, is part of our um, ancestral homelands. This is the, you know, our Southern Paiute area. So not only was this, you know, uh, you know, making a move towards the future for our people and our community, for all of our communities, but also an act of land back. Um, here's that uh, building that where the rabbi lived and here it is today. So here it is today. <laughs> it's taken a few years and a lot of uh, literally blood, sweat and tears. Um, but we have the center space that's purple. That is our gallery um, community center space. The green building is our art studios as well as the orange building is the art studios.
for pictures. But super proud of this. And we've actually activated this spot a lot, even though we haven't been like officially, officially open. You know, there's still a lot of work to do, but this back lot space was really activated, especially, you know, um, you know, when things got lifted through the pandemic, we were able to do outdoor events where we gathered our community. And here's the back of one of the spaces. And here's what the, the inside looks like. So you saw like the, uh, the inside where we're sitting in basically a pile of rubble <laughs> and it was tore up, but we've really uh, made this into an amazing communal space and art gallery. Here's another picture of the inside. And we've taken that area, that space where they used to keep the Torah and other religious texts. And we've kind of kept that same idea. We've used the bottom of it as a storage area, but we also have this, uh, you know, ofrenda, you know, type of installation space. And each artist has used it, you know, differently. But besides, you know, just people coming in to see the works of art on the on the walls, we've also done these amazing community events where we make zines, we make valentines, uh, make different collages. And this has been really engaging. And so I just want to make clear, too. So our space is not just for our Southern Paiute people or not just for our Native American people in Las Vegas, but for all people, because we're all in this community together. We all have, we have this really beautiful community. Uh, if we're in like more of a Latinx area, um, African American, but it's all of us together, all of us together, you know, through our struggles uh, that we're really making our triumphs. And, you know, continuing to open doorways for the community. This is a picture uh, that was sponsored by the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We did this uh, opening doorway. So the old doors, when we we're rehabbing all these buildings, we, you know, took the old doors out, put new ones in. And we just used them as a, uh, well, ca canvas. <laughs> so community members, young and old, got together and they got to, you know, paint and, and add to these, you know, beautiful doors front and back too. That was a good time. We actually did that for a few months. It was a lot of fun. And we continue to have fun. We continue to do, you know, paint projects, uh, engaging with people. And we've done things on our like final Fridays, like the last Friday of the month. We'll do, you know, just some kind of art activity, whether it's like the collages or, you know, painting, but just doing something that really, you know, pulls people together. And it's intergenerational too. Because like I said, our community is big. I mean, uh, besides, you know, our Las Vegas Pie Tribe being only 50 members, the Native American community in Las Vegas is actually 60,000 people plus. And, you know, of course, you know, from all these, all different cultures, all different heritages. And here's another photo of our backspace being activated. This is uh, Gina Yazi from our Southern Paiute community. Uh, she's fancy shawl dancing. And we have some, you know, members and, you know, other guests there that are taking part and enjoying these beautiful dances. But it's also a place for other ceremonies. Uh, like I said, we uh, we have a predominantly Latinx community here. And so we do a lot of things together. And this is the Calpoli Tletico. Uh, please excuse my pronunciation of that. Uh, but they've been really involved with us too and really you know, blessing the grounds and blessing our community with all the amazing things that they do. And we'll continue to do. I mean, we get together with our community, whether we're doing, you know, an art exhibit, an opening, or being able to share space. Like even last weekend, some of our community members got together and were taking part in Ruben Ochoa's uh, lesson on the Aztec calendar. But our spaces are also a space for commerce. Um, this is Solacito Beads, um, hashtag Solacito Beads. And she's selling some of her beadwork, her earrings, but you know, we also have our shirts from our nonprofit organization, Indigenous AF. And here's some community members. And this is from the Indigimart. So we like to do a different activation each time. And we do this thing after things taken. So in um, like the third week of November, we like to do, you know, build commerce for our indigenous community, be able to sell, you know, whatever they're selling, their art, clothes, jewelry, you name it. And here's the inside of one of our studio spaces. 
And these are some of our uh, members from our nonprofit Indigenous AF, as well as our artists that are in-house. So we have Brent Holmes, Ashanti McGee, Sochi Sitlali, uh, Juan Cuevas. And even now we have uh, Theo So, who's also a member of our tribe, uh, doing Captain Paiu comics. Uh, we have Danger, who's a, a really skilled ceramics artist. And we also have Avis Charlie. So we have this really well-rounded group of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, and all sharing space within our studios. And our place, our, our spaces and our events are also where kids can be kids. It's a lot of fun. I've been grown up kids like myself. Uh, this is a photo from one of our Halloween events of some of our community members, um, and also myself in my fry bread costume. It's a fry bread. <laughs> I like to get really into costumes, especially when I have time. Uh, but yeah, just time to have fun and engage with community because my activism is centered around my joy, pure indigenous joy, pure community joy. This is a big part of my activism and what I am pulling into this year and into the future because we need more of this. We need more of this community action. Yeah, you know, places where we can just be ourselves and have fun, get to meet new friends and and just live, right? And play Foursquare because yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, we got into Foursquare. I swear it did not stop for like three hours. It was amazing. Uh, but also being able to mentor some youth. Here's some of our volunteers. Uh, this is DJ and his one of his friends. And they volunteered for our event for Indigenous AF. And we'll continue to volunteer, too. I mean, they have a lot of good things to say about it. So it's like, yeah, let's keep doing events. We'll keep doing it. And like I said, you know, opening doorways, opening doors to, you know, other people's dreams, because that's what I really like about, you know, just the, the way my activism has gone is like helping other artists, helping other people realize their dreams, what they want to do. And so uh, this is Sochi and Juan, uh, or Quetzal Visions, and this is them in one of, the, one of the studio spaces. But also using our space and using our voice to you know, center issues that are within the communities, because no matter what, you know, we're always gonna be dealing with issues within our communities. There's always going to be something. So we are able to you know, uh, share space with community members to, to call people in. I mean, I feel like over the years, you know, a lot of things have been called out left and right. But what happens when we call people in, when we call people in for conversation? This is over an issue uh, when this restaurant opened um, called Peyote. And some of our community members were outraged about this, that they shouldn't be, you know, because that is a plant medicine. It has been used in the Native American church. It's been used for, you know, some of the, the danza. Like they've, you know, discussed this as a plant medicine and, you know, to see it in neon lights for a, you know, a restaurant was uh, insulting to some of our members. So we called it in and we, re we have our space to do that, to have this discussion with the owner of the restaurant, the owner of the, the, the space that it was at, and to really hear from our community and for them to have their voice and say, you know, why this is harmful and so these are some of the things that we, we still continue to do and will do into the future. And with my art practice, so with my art practice, I do curation, I'm still making my art. And one of the things I'm most proud of is the Awani exhibition and symposium. I was able to curate the show at UNLV and it was supported so much from our community and from the university. And this took place at the Donna Beam Gallery. But I was able to pull in, you know, uh, the artists that I really look up to and that I wanted to be in conversation with, that I wanted my art to be in conversation with. So there was Loretta Burden, Noel Garcia, Jean Lamar, Melissa Malero Moose, Natani Noda, Kara Romero, Roseby Simpson, Roxanne Swensel, and Shelby Westika. And my work is still, you know, in different, uh, you know, museum spaces, you know, that conversation is still being had. Like, even though I did the performance of genocide, that conversation is still moving into, you know, other exhibitions like two cultures, one family. And here's a picture of me and Sochi with her beautiful art. 
and being able to celebrate ourselves too. Two Cultures, One Family was curated by Professor, well, Dr. Erika uh, Gisela Bad. And this show is actually going to be closing next weekend on January 27th uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. at the Barrick Museum of Fine Art on our UNLV campus. So please go check it out this week or attend the, the closing reception because this was a, a labor of love and a prayer and a grounding ceremony. It was all of the things, all of the things. So if you're in the Las Vegas area, please check it out. Um, here's a flyer for that. <laughs> and if you want to see some of my work, uh, the next exhibition that I'm going to be in is Inherent Memory. It's going to be at the Museum of Contemporary Native American Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that will be happening February 24th through June 25th. And this was curated by Melissa Malero Moose. And this is a photograph from that collection. Uh, but also if you find yourself in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, so our gallery space is still doing its thing. And the first exhibition for this year is a retrospect by Justin Favela, Fantasia Fantasy. And it's his life work. And I'm so happy to be able to host uh, this type of event in my space, well, in our space, my myself, my partner. And yeah, to really engage with community and, and to be a part of it. It's, it's very humbling. And there, there's so many times where I'm just like, wow, I'm like really fangirling over Justin. <laughs> I don't think he knows that I do that, but I do. I still geek out a little bit. And I hope I never lose that. I actually like geeking out over artists. It keeps me excited. Um, but yeah, I'm going to end on that. I wanted to save some time you know, for any questions. I know we have a number of people that are in our session. And let's open it up. Let's see, Jen. Okay, what advice do you have for indigenous artists who are wanting to use their voices through art but may not know where to start? Hmm. You see, if they're wanting to use their voices through their art, but may not know where to start. This is a tough one because uh, through my practice, sometimes it's instant where I'm just like, uh, like when it came to the genocide piece that was made in about a, a week and a half, like not even a week. And it just happened to like, once the idea was there, once I breathed the idea in the air, everything just started to fall into place. Um, I knew the message, I knew the hurt that I was feeling, and I had to unleash that. So I started to write it down. I started to write down ideas. I, I keep a notebook. I mean, even here, just like I have this little notebook just to like sketch out ideas and write, you know, get used to writing. Always keep a like a little notebook with you. And I keep some like Prismacolors with me, <laughs> you know, in case I need to draw out an idea or a feeling. And, and just go with it. It's just like, all right, I am feeling this. Why am I feeling this? And then start to ask yourself those questions. Um, you know, like, how would I want to interpret this? What medium would help best convey this message? Uh, what do I want my hands to get on? What is tangible? Uh, what do I already have? You know, like, what do I already have in my wheelhouse to work with? Or what do I want to engage with? And so as an artist, you're going to start to build more questions for yourself. But that's good. But that's good. And then because when you want a lot of questions, because then you start to be able to, to answer those. So definitely start with your, you know, have a notebook because you never know when inspiration is going to, uh, to hit you. I mean, it could be at any moment. So always have something because sometimes at the end of the day, like when I haven't had my notebook, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I had such a good idea for this spirally something. Uh, what was it? <laughs> it's, it's missing. So, so yeah, I would, I would say definitely keep a notebook with you and, um, and think about the artists that inspire you too. look at their work. I'm always looking at the artists that inspire me and I, you know, and learning about them too. Like, uh, like, all right, not just like, all right, I like looking at their, their, their work, but really dive in, look at any essays that were written about those artists, look at any symposiums that are coming up where you can learn a little bit more about that as well. Um, history is a good fuel, you know, for me. And the more I tap into my cultural ways, the more I want to, you know, make art about that with respect to not giving everything away. I mean, I think we all know how that is as, uh, you know, people of culture, 
you know, like not, you know, there are ways that we hold sacred and that are not public facing, but there's also some stories that we can have to where they really help, you know, like where the creator goes to, to dream, you know, that, that beautiful image of the bighorn sheep in the sky uh, that came from, you know, just, you know, some of the things people were saying about those areas, but not without giving all of it away, of course. Okay, Let's see, how do you foresee the balance of joy and discomfort coming together for your local native and non-native community as a whole? You see, foresee the balance of joy and discomfort. I think I'm understanding this right. Do you mean where we're, you know, just uh, like a mixing of cultures and community and different people from different backgrounds? Um, well, one of the things about our space, if I'm understanding the question right, but our space is not on tribal land. Our space is not like owned by the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. It's owned by myself and my partner. And so, you know, we both come from, uh, you know, mixed ancestry, uh, mixed heritage. And when we think about, you know, those different parts of us, well, how can we honor, you know, who we are and honoring community? Because our friends are from so many different backgrounds. You know, it's not just Latinx, African-American, but Maori, uh, Filipino, Filipina. Uh, there's so many beautiful cultures in Las Vegas. And so um, I haven't felt a level of discomfort um, from that that blending together of our community, but more like a way that we see, um, you know, what we have in common. I mean, there's been so many different conversations about, you know, us like, like, oh, that's your, you know, you weave this, hey, our people do this too. This is a, and then able to kind of share those ideas. And I think it's a really good just talking point to just finding familiarity, but also finding, you know, like what, you know, what you have in common. So it's a beautiful, I don't feel the discomfort in it, I feel the the beauty in it and the excitement and being able to learn about other cultures too. Let's see what can oh, go back to that. Okay, what can white social arts activists do to collaborate with indigenous communities? and invite their creativity into the wider community in ways that, oh, I can't see the rest, Oop. are respectful, including not part, trying to pander, imitate, not trying to speak for others. Let me see. Okay, let me go back, go back to the top part. Oh, I could do that. <laughs> what can, okay. Okay, so what can non-native uh, activists do to collaborate with indigenous communities? Um, yeah, invite them. <laughs> get to know them, get to be in community with them. Um, you know what's funny? Um, I was asked, uh, well, actually I asked a, a relative, like, how can I get to know, um, you know, my other relatives? Because like I said, I identify as a Southern Paiute woman because I was raised here in Las Vegas. Um, but how do I get in touch with my Pawnee, Muscogee, you know, communities? Uh, she simply said, you go there. <laughs> you go there. Every tribe or community has a celebration, a feast, a powwow, a, you know, a certain thing that's happening. You know, go there, go there and support the communities, support the artists, get to know the, the vendors, the people. And um, yeah, so I'll be going to probably like the Muscogee Arts Festival, basically with the shirt that says, are you my relative? <laughs> you know, but, but just being present, it's like go and, um, and get to know them too, because tribes, uh, different tribal communities have education committees. They have uh, powwow committees, you know, get involved, see how you can be involved. And, um, and getting to know who those artists are. Do some research. Do research on those artists. So if you're looking to touch base with the, I guess, specific community, um, you know, Google search the name of that community and artists. So you're going to find a number of different artists that pop up. You know, unfortunately, if you put just simply native art, you're going to get a lot of the stereotypes. So you got to be specific about the community you're trying to touch base with and, and be intentional, too. Um, it's always good to make offerings. You know, every every tribe is different. Every tribe is different on their cultural ways 
and how they connect. But, you know, being able to do an offering or if there's, you know, some type of event to bring something to give is always, you know, pretty respectful. And also New Woo Arts, uh, we do cultural consultation. Hey, a little plug. <laughs> and so um, with the cultural consultation, we're able to get to know different communities and plan, um, you know, uh, an action plan for people who are trying to communicate or engage with different places. So thank you. That's a great question. Let me see, how do you balance art produced for activism versus art for commercial gains or as part of grant requirements? Ooh, oh, let me put my indigenous AF secretary hat on. Um, okay, so balancing art for activism versus art for commercial gains. So the commercial part, I'm like, have I sold any art? Oh yeah, I sold that. <laughs> we don't dance for money, but I sold it as a part of like a you know it the Nevada Museum wanted that a part of their collection, um, like commercial art. I mean, I have sold like T-shirts or prints um, at different spaces, um, but a lot of my my draw is really towards our our studio spaces. So our our business has gone from you know me you know just kind of selling at the powwows to actually renting out these studio spaces, um, partnering with other uh, organizations, you know, for different events, you know, for them to, to rent space. So that has been, you know, a part of my business model, but also uh, being able to do the cultural consultation. Um, I, I've done a lot of trainings. I've done uh, like trainings on cultural protocols. Um, and, and that has been, you know, just a part of my job and I love it. It's almost like, you know, find something you really like to do and make that a part of, you know, your, your job. And so that's what, uh, has been for me. Um, when it gets to like art selling, I have another number of art products or art, uh, works that are just sitting in my studio, to be honest. Um, because again, it's like my art practice has shifted to curating community. And that has been, a, that's been my art practice lately. Uh, let me see, and grant requirements. Um, so as Indigenous AF, I mean, that's the nonprofit that's at the Nuwu Art. And Indigenous AF, well, hey, that started as our uh, kind of a kitschy t-shirt <laughs> that I used to sell at the powwows years ago. And then, you know, it turned into this all encompassing, like, well, what does AF mean? Well, for our, our space, I mean, AF is very cheeky. Y'all know what that means. But it also means now like arts facilities, Afrofuturisms, um, ancestral food waste. And it has all these different meanings. And it means different things for different people, allies and friends. So it's all encompassing of our, our beautiful communities. And so we took that idea and, you know, moved it into, you know, being a, a nonprofit organization. And so through that, we've been writing for grants for our programs. So when we do have uh, moments where we have our, our dancers coming out, culture bearers, speakers, teachers, that we're able to, to give them something, not just expecting people to come out for free because we pay our artists and we want to be able to, you know, have that reciprocity, you know, for our community to, to engage. Yeah. Let me see. Are there any resources you can recommend for indigenous artists who may not be located near larger cities or other tribes? Ooh, ooh, there's a lot. There's a lot. Um, I'm really uh, digging NDN Collective. NDN Collective is doing, you know, so many different grants and fellowships. And I really like what they're doing because they're, their span isn't just, you know, the, the United States, but it, it jumps off to other indigenous communities in different countries. I think what they're doing is really just beautiful, absolutely beautiful um, resources. Um, you can also like look up like indigenous, you know, grants, indigenous arts, um, NEA, National Endowment of the Arts, um, but that's off the top of my head. But I know there's several more too. But you just gotta, you know, be able to to look for those. And if you're not located in larger cities, um, I don't know if you're on this this area. But West Staff, West Staff uh, does a lot of different grants and fellowships, and is engaging with different, you know, Native artists, but also artists from uh, different POC artists.
All right. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> took, me a minute, took me a minute to figure out how to get back up here. <laughs> so, it looks like all the questions have been answered. I do want to also kind of add to the question about what can, um, why artists and activists do to help support like indigenous artists. And I would all like to say like I at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian am also a good resource to reach out to because I noticed you're from the same general area um, and we I can help either with like brainstorming or connecting you with people within our community as well. But of course, you know, Fawn is a wonderful <laughs> resource as well. Um, so yeah, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. And I look forward to seeing all of you at, at the next session, which will be on February 15th. Um, so I'm going to end the session now. Thank you again. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. So